to the Not Carrie Bradshaw YouTube channel. In this video, I am bittersweetly, if that's a term, recapping the last episode of season one of Lovecraft Country, episode 10. It's called Full Circle. And I first of all just want to say I'm so grateful for the show that we had something like this during such uncertain and tumultuous and scary and anxiety inducing times in our country or in our world rather so i have really enjoyed having this show uh for 10 episodes and being able to talk about it with you guys i feel like we built a sense of community around this show and just talking about these different aspects of the black experience so i you know shouts out to the creators shouts out to misha green shouts out to the two lovely ladies who host the Lovecraft Country Radio podcast, which I keep urging people to listen to so that they can fill in some of the holes that I don't know. And I think they do a really great job of giving reference materials of how people can get more from the show and where to go from here with some of the, the themes that are brought up. I will say though, unfortunately, this was my least favorite episode and not just because of what happens at the end but because I think the commitment to bringing everything full circle like the title says maybe forced them to put a whole whole lot into this one episode which tonally it didn't feel like that the rest of the season I felt like I had watched a movie every episode this one I felt like I missed something and I even went back and watched it a second time after listening to the podcast because I'm like I don't think I, I got everything that I'm supposed to get from this and I see so many people on Twitter talk about like how Lovecraft Country is confusing and I don't you know I just don't get it and stuff like that and I'm like well they tell you everything this episode I was confused uh I will get into why um but you know before we get into that i just want to thank the creators and thank you guys for joining me um as i've recapped this show which is a very different genre for me so i really enjoyed the little sense of family and community that we have around lovecraft country so let's just jump right in share um so this episode opens where they have come back from the past or i guess back to the future i don't know <laughs> um, so they're back from the past when they went to Tulsa to reclaim the Book of Names from Tick's ancestors and they now have to try to heal Dee from the curse that was put upon her using the Book of Names. Okay. Tick opens the book using this incantation and I'm going to say, like... <laughs> One of the things that makes scary movies scary is the jump effect. I definitely jumped when that book opened. So this incantation unbounds because that the book had been spellbound to be closed. Um, so this unbounds the book. It's open and Tick and Letty immediately pass out and go to the ancestral plane. Similar to what we saw in Black Panther um, where he was, you know, R.I.P. to Chadwick again but you know in Black Panther when he went to the ancestral plane and it was the panthers and the trees and the you know all that jazz so this is their own ancestral plane that Hannah inadvertently created so Tick goes to Hannah in the burning house in Artem which he's been seeing in his dreams for a while and he talks with Hannah. Letty goes back to the burning house in Tulsa to talk with Hattie. And Tick learns that, number one, he is going to have to be the vessel through which this family is saved and protected. And what Hannah reveals to him is that she was haunted by the flames of her setting this house on fire and she ended up killing herself because she says every time she went to sleep she couldn't bear the pain of burning over and over again every night 
So she said something that I thought was really profound and that I really took to because I, I'm a Leo, I'm a fire sign. I'm not super into astrology, but I do think that everyone has an element that they are more drawn to. And for a really long time, I thought that mine was fire, but I just felt like, I think I have this commitment to wanting to be like a very cool, calm girl. I think I wanted to be like a water sign or something, just like chill, whatever. But, and I kind of rejected fire being like my element. And I only recently came to understand that there is beauty in fire, that fire illuminates and that it provides warmth and comfort and that it's a place of, of community for some people, you know, sitting around a fire. And it helped me to kind of embrace it, right? So when Hannah says that she realized that the fire was her rage manifested physically, she learned that it wasn't something that she had to fear, but that it was something that she needed to learn to tame. And what she was also talking about was magic. And when she said this incantation to protect her family and her blood heirs from the order, from the sons of Adam, she made a mistake because she was operating from a place of fear. And we switch over to Letty, where Hattie is telling her something similar, which is don't allow fear to dictate the way you use this magic. And I think that there was something really powerful in that because this was literally them breaking a generational curse of trying to protect their family, but in a very fear-based way. So we see how Montrose abused Tick because he had been abused by his father for being gay, for being feminine. And so, you know, because Montrose had this fear that his son would wouldn't be able to thrive in the world unless he was very tough, he abused him. And it's the same mindset of operating from fear as a means to protect. And it's kind of a recurring theme, so I thought that they did a really good job of bringing that part full circle. Um, and Hattie tells Letty, it's now your responsibility to protect this book, to use this book, to use this magic, to protect the family in a way that isn't based on fear. So I thought that that was really cool that they were able to go back to the ancestors and to see what the actual flaw was so that they can move forward. And I think that's really powerful too because anyone who does any kind of work to heal past trauma or to get to a better place mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, that journey is not linear. It's sometimes cyclical. Sometimes you have to go back to the past to understand why some things are the way that they are so that you can exist better in the present and in the future. It's not a straight shot to healing. So their journey has not been a straight shot. They had to use a multiverse machine and go back in time and go to the future. It's all over the place. And I think that that's really, really cool because that's very true of what it means to be on a journey of healing and self-discovery. Um, so poor Tick, after talking with Hannah, he then goes to, I'm guessing this is the apartment that he grew up in with his family and he sees his mom and this moment of him really understanding like, damn, I'm really going to have to die to do this shit. You know, I have to save everybody using my life and his mom I thought it was really beautiful that the intimacy of him laying his head in her lap and just saying like I don't want to die because like what's more real than that honestly like it's one thing to to know we're all eventually going to die right it's completely different to know when and how and to just walk right into it especially as a sacrifice for your family and everyone else so something that his mom said that really kind of freaked me out though was her saying that in her life, she realized that we think that we have choices when we don't. And I was like, bitch, you ain't had no choices. You know, and I think she was speaking to her own experience because back then she didn't. You know, I would like to think that now we live in a place where we have more choices 
than they did but I was just like oh god that is so bleak I really didn't want to hear that I'm just admit, I, I don't want to hear that I don't have a choice in my life you know um I also really liked how she explained her George and Montrose as a family that this trauma that they endured in Tulsa bonded them and that that was family I think Tick like a lot of us has this commit had this commitment to family should look this way and should operate this way that's just not true most families are not the typical nuclear family that we were raised seeing reflected everywhere it's just not and I think it's really cool that this was that that's kind of a modern concept presented in that time frame y'all don't have my notes because I try to be very thorough and there was a whole whole lot in this episode so I'm gonna try to make this short but we got a lot to unpack um another thing I just want to say I am really happy with the conversation that Hannah and Hattie both had with Tick and Letty about using your gifts properly I think that's something that we can all learn in the present so moving right along um everyone comes together on the ancestral plane and they say this spell they heal d i'm trying to understand, why didn't d's arm heal is it because that was where topsy grabbed her drop down in the comments and let me know if you guys picked up on on what that was about like why her arm specifically didn't heal with everything else it's super clear that montrose does not <clears throat> want tick and Letty to go through with this because Montrose feels like there has to be another way to thwart Christina's plans than for my child to die especially as they keep getting so close to building on their relationship and on their intimacy as father and son and he just wants to hold on to his kid and I fully understand that I too would be like hey, we gotta figure something else out <laughs> um so Tick and Letty have the book of names. They have this information from the ancestors about how to actually defeat Christina. And it's going to take a physical connection between Tick's body, Titus, Titus's body, and Christina's body, right? So that's kind of the point of this episode is that they are on this journey to get a piece of Titus and to get a piece of Christina. And they have Tick and then that way they can do this like binding spell right so they have to resurrect Titus <laughs> so back to the basement they go on the elevator to resurrect Titus and there was something really cool about them being in that circle and confronting this the source of their family's pain and being able to kill him which it was a struggle at first and I was like oh shit like when he didn't stay and like bleeped out and went to cause this car accident with Christina. It, it, it was a lot. Um, so they are able to defeat him, to kill him. You know, the ancestors go back to their respective spiritual homes. And um, that's one thing that we can check off the to-do list. We got a piece of Titus's body. Great. Awesome. That was terrifying. Um, as an aside, just to pull over... D confronts Hippolyta about having left her and I really like this because I would like to think that this would have happened back then but even now it's not really common for parents to take ownership of the ways in which they fail their kids so I really like that D was able to express herself and that Hippolyta received what she was saying. D has been through a lot like you know and I think obviously she feels like Hippolyta is responsible because she abandoned her in order to go and find herself and you know again I said Hippolyta was like fuck them kids but she feels like I guess from Dee's perspective it's kind of like well was it worth it you know and then she says this thing about you probably couldn't have protected me anyway I didn't really fully know what that meant um but i was happy that they had that confrontation and that it wasn't something that was just washed over and also between hippolyta and little murder from p valley i really want to dye my hair blue um let me know what y'all think and also throw me some money so i can do it so i really 
really going to appreciate how Christina just like rolled up in the garage like she owned the place. Like white women be having nerve. Oh my God, sit, sit down somewhere. And it it's just so bizarre, but it's also so on brand for her to be like, listen, it's nothing personal that I have to kill you and use your body in order for me to get what I want. Like, I'm not trying to hurt you, but it's just necessary. It's just like, bitch, what kind of shit is that to say to somebody? Like, I'm going to kill you, but it's nothing personal. Like, at that point, I was just like, kill this bitch, please. Like, I have been over Christina for a minute, and that she just, for me, is the embodiment of white feminism where it's just listen i have my goals and i'm gonna do whatever i have to to get what i want and i mean it's nothing personal towards y'all but i too have had a hard life and i just want to like girl fuck you oh so upsetting so as she's leaving she's basically telling tick like listen i know y'all have the book of names if you just give me the book, I'll go away. I won't even fool with y'all. I'll find another way to cast this spell, not using your body so that I can be immortal. And of course, finally, it's like, don't trust this white woman. So of course they don't give it to her. And just like a white woman, she gets mad and takes back the invulnerability spell that she had given Letty. So it's just like trifling, right? Anyway, but are we surprised? No. So, um, I don't know if you guys noticed when they were driving back to the house that another black family had moved into the neighborhood across the street from them. And I was like, yes, upset the neighbors. Love it. We love to see it. So, Tick goes to meet with Gia. Gia in this bar, first of all, her look was everything. Y'all know I love a good vintage look. And the fact that she asked that man, like, are you willing to die to fuck me? It's just like, can we all just start saying that? I mean, that's a real easy, surefire way to get somebody up off your back that you're really not feeling. Like, you willing to die for this? Because um, I thought it was really cool. Initially, when Tick goes to meet up with Gia, I'm like, what you doing? I don't like this. It don't feel right. But I think after him having this conversation with his mom, he's come to realize and accept that Gia's destiny is, entwi is intertwined with his and that they are somewhat of a family. And I appreciate him telling her that what we had did matter. And I'm sorry for the way I spoke to you. It's just like, now that's the real fantasy. That's the real sci-fi right there. Is that a man admitted that he was wrong and took accountability? More of that, please. More of that, please. We love to see it on the rare occasion that it happens. So Ruby and Letty have had this conversation me at the cemetery where their mom is buried and basically Letty is asking Ruby like we need a part of Christine's body so that my baby daddy don't die and Ruby I think is just fed up with the fact that Letty is always coming to her when she needs something it's never like hey girl you want to hang out or you want to get dinner or whatever it's not a sisterly kind of thing it's like Letty unintentionally uses the fact that that's her sister to ask her to do things even though letty really does want to have like a sisterhood and familial bond with ruby i think ruby is just kind of over this is like why you always call me when you need something it's very terry from soul food energy you know and ruby is just like you're still doing it like you're still only calling me when you need something and at that point i was like oh ruby is gonna somehow sabotage this like ruby is I don't trust Ruby. I said last episode, I didn't trust Ruby. So, you know, here we are. Um, I also, when we saw Ruby have the conversation with Christina, it, mm, for the first time we didn't see William and it was really Christina and Ruby. And I could not tell if Ruby was playing Christina because it just seemed like, you know, she was cheering her on so much. And we now know that she was playing her. But it, at the time, I was like, you don't let this woman convince you that you are an exceptional black and that you don't need to stand up for your family. I'll be damned. So there was that. And then we see Tick and Letty and the church. And what they made me realize on the podcast is that this whole 
season, Letty really has been on a journey to find her faith and to find her relationship with God. And I am really into the fact that they did this baptism together as a means to solidify their relationship because I'm a person who doesn't really believe in weddings like that. So I was happy to see another means by which a couple can solidify their union. And I thought it was really cool that they did that through a baptism, um, you know, before all hell broke loose. So speaking of all hell breaking loose, the scene in the car where they all pile into Woody, it's everybody, it's our whole team of heroes, Justice League, Avengers, whichever one, you know, you lean towards. And I really like when shows do a good job of creating a collective feeling because everyone who was watching that scene because of the levity of it and because of the joy and we finally have everyone together and everyone is having a happy bright moment you knew something shitty was about to happen and i really like that there are people who are skilled at creating a collective feeling like that's really dope to me um here's where shit got super confusing because after that scene it became super clear to me that like, okay, Tick really is going to die. Because I'm going to be real, this whole season, I've been hoping Uncle George is going to come back and he's going to find a way to do this without killing Tick. But that scene made me realize like, nah, he going to die. So, um, here's where, again, things got confusing. So, they're in the woods around Artem. They're going back to Artem with these tools to defeat Christina and you know they're laying down the salt Tick is practicing a bit of cannibalism so that he can be a part of the spell and Christina and Ruby are elsewhere like in this tower right not Christina and Ruby sorry Letty and Ruby Christina it becomes really apparent that Ruby isn't Ruby Ruby is actually Christina and Letty picks up on this and they get into this fight where it's revealed that Christina killed Ruby because she caught her trying to steal this potion for Letty. And for the slightest minute, it seems like Christina was upset that she had to kill Ruby, um, which I find it so interesting because you're willing to sacrifice everybody else's life. You are actually willing to sacrifice Ruby's life in order to do what it is that you want, but you want to act heartbroken over the one black person who you know and care about in your weird way. And there's a message in there somewhere that I don't have the time to dig through, but I found that quite interesting. I don't understand how after Ruby, Christina, Ruby Christina, pushes Letty off of this this tower roof how Letty didn't die I have a theory I'll get to it in a moment um D is in the car alone in the woods and I'm just confused because didn't we just have a whole situation where we left D alone when she needed support why is D on the trip like girl what I, I was deeply confused by that, but then we see the black show, Shogath, is that how you pronounce that monster thing, comes and saves her from the other, you know, white monsters or whatever. And what? <laughs> Just what? What was that? So the rest of the crew is, you know, laying salt around Ar Ar uh, Artem, and then they get jumped by villagers. Okay. So, Tick makes it to this altar situation. Um, you know, he gets laid out, and Christina is doing this spell, and again, what? So, okay. Maybe we need to go forward to go back. So, Letty is revived. She's running to the scene, you know, to this altar. The rest of the crew, they're on their knees. They're basically like watching Tick dying. And 
then it becomes apparent to Gia that her purpose is to link up with this dark force that comes from this the spell that Christina casts, right? And so she uses her tails to connect Christina and Tick's bodies so that this spell that Letty is casting will work. Okay. Through Gia, we can see that before all this took place, Tick wrote his dad a letter. Tick introduced D to the Shogath, Shogath, whatever the monster is called, and that Ruby Christina said something as she looked down on Letty's body. I'm guessing that that's when she gave her back the invulnerability, but that math ain't math then because if you already killed her how can you give it back to her and i guess that was maybe ruby christina uh keeping her promise to ruby not to hurt letty but that doesn't make sense to me you already pushed her like did you say it as she was falling i i don't understand that um the spell ends up working that letty casts where she binds Christina and all white people for magic. That's what the ultimate goal of this was, is to reclaim the magic for this family, for black people. But I don't understand if they were able to defeat Christina in this way. Like, why couldn't Tick have lived through it? It just kind of, I was just a bit confused by it, honestly. And it was so devastating to see Montrose just so sure that Tick could or would survive and he, you know, he's not coming back and like Montrose having to accept that. I did think that it was really cool that Dee rolls up, you know, wearing her daddy's jacket with this big black monster to protect her and she ends up being the one to kill Christina using her mechanical arm that Arinthia Blue aka Hippolyta created for her and that kind of gave me Arya Stark with the Night King vibes where it was just like this is this is cool but why why was it D and I guess Something they said on the podcast made it make a little bit of sense where it's just like, you know, the, the youth will save us all. So for a little black girl to be the ultimate hero in the story, it's like, okay, I can fool with that. But it was also kind of like, what, what, in a way? I thought even the scene like with the, sh the, the monster like howling at the moon, I thought it was a super cool scene, but I was still just like, maybe this will make more sense in season two if we get a season two. But um, I definitely got super emotional as they were reading Tick's letter to Montrose out loud, which was, you know, you now have the chance to be the father to him that you wanted to be to me, you know, you get a do-over um yeah i don't know if i did a good job of explaining that i feel like i was all over the place because the episode was kind of all over the place i don't fully understand what happened and y'all love to tell me when i get things wrong in the comments so somebody explain this to me because like i said even after listening to the podcast that goes with this show like in an official capacity i was like i don't know what just happened so y'all let me know. Um, thank you guys for coming along on this journey with me. I 100% just want to say I enjoyed this series as a whole. I'm just confused about how it ended. And I kind of had similar feelings about um, Watchmen. I loved Watchmen. I loved the themes and some of the things that they did with that show. But I did walk away with some questions. Um, so it's not to say that, you know, the creators failed or anything like that. I'm just not sure what the hell happened. So um, I'm going to figure out some new things to review so you guys stay tuned. Be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe, and all of those good things. Thank you again for joining me for 10 episodes of Recaps, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye!